Good evening. It's rather late in the night, but I had endeavoured and purposed in my heart to do four chapters, one each of each gospel, and I only managed to do two in the daytime. So I'm reading now from chapter 10, the book of Mark. From there he went to the area of Judea across the Jordan. A crowd of people, as was so often the case, went along, and he, as he so often did, taught them. Pharisees came up, intending to give him a hard time, and they asked him, Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife? And Yeshua answered, What did Moses command? They answered, Moses gave, Moses gave permission to fill out a certificate of dismissal and divorce her. And Yeshua answered, Moses wrote this command only as a concession to your hard-heartedness. In the original creation, God made male and female, to be together. Because of this, a man leaves his mother and father, and in marriage he becomes one flesh with a woman, no longer two individuals, but forming a new unity. Because God created this organic union of the two sexes, and no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. Let me read from the New King James. Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and, they shall, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. In the house of his disciples, in the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery against him. The two become one flesh. If only husbands and wives understood that. In God's eyes, when we marry, and remember, if you remember, I said marriage is not a signing on a paper. Marriage is consummating in the marriage bed. That's marriage. It's the exchanging of blood. That's marriage. It's a covenant ordained by God, not instituted by man. When you marry, you become one flesh. That means you both are as one person. What you do, it's as good as your husband did, did it. What he does is as good as you doing it. So, if either one of you is somewhere, both of you are there. Therefore, nothing of yours can be separate or individual or your own. Your life is his and his life is yours. One flesh, if he does something wrong, you can run to your closet and pray to your Father in heaven and say, Father, forgive us. Forgive me. If he does, if you do something wrong, he can do it. He can run to the Father and say, forgive us. Forgive me. We both are represented as one person to the Father. 
So if you are cruel to your wife, you're doing it against yourself. If you are unloving to your husband, you are unloving to yourself. That's why marriage is so difficult. If there is no self-love, how do you love your wife or your husband well enough? You first have to love yourself well enough. If you, he says, love each other as you love yourself, love your neighbor as you love yourself, it has to start from loving yourself. Many marriages where the husband or the wife is nasty with their spouse. It's because they first don't love themselves. They have self-loathing. If you, if you loathe yourself, how can you love your spouse? Because your spouse, whether you know it or not, is you, is yourself. You two are one flesh. You've heard this today. Now understand who you are in a marriage. Understand it. And then the people brought children to Yeshua, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off. And Yeshua was irate. And he let them know it. Don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you will never get in. Then, gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands on them, blessing them. God loves children so much. Woe to the man or woman who causes one child, one child to suffer, one child to be shamed or mistreated. And woe to those who are in charge of many children. If under their very noses, children are being abused, mistreated, ridiculed, shamed, put down, punished, Gosh, the Bible says their angels, their angels are standing by. Especially teachers. With reverence, handle the children in your care. With reverence. They are especially, especially precious to God. As he went out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with great reverence and said, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? And Yeshua looked at him and said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandment. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Honor mother and father. And he said, Teacher, I have from my youth kept all of these. And Yeshua looked him hard in the eye and loved him. And he said, There's one thing left. Go, sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And then come follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and was not about to let go. When Yeshua said, Go sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. Then all your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. It is, he said this because God has also said, You cannot outgive me. Whatever you do 
to the least of your brothers, you do to me. Whatever you give to the poorest of the poor, you give to me. So the debt is on God. Whatever you give to the poor, the debt is on God. And God is no man's debtor. He doesn't just give you back what you gave. He gives it back exponentially, sevenfold, tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold, depending on what sort of heart you gave it with. When you give, he says, I love a cheerful giver. When you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is giving. When you give, cast it like bread upon the waters. And they say, Chappar far ke. He gives Chappar far ke. You give Dil khol ke. And then, looking at his disciples, Yeshua said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter into the kingdom of heaven? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing. But Yeshua kept on. Can you imagine how difficult? I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into God's kingdom. That set the disciples back on their heels. Then who has any chance at all? They asked. And Yeshua was blunt. He said, no, cha- no chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in this world if you let God do it. You have no chance at all if you think you can do it by yourself with your money, with your wealth, with your contacts, with your abilities. No chance at all. But every chance if you allow God to do it. Peter tried another angle. He said, we left everything and followed you. And Yeshua said, mark my words. No one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, land, whatever, because of me and the message will lose out. No one will lose out. They'll get it all back, but multiplied many times in homes and brothers, sisters, mothers, children and land, but also in trouble. And then the bonus of eternal life. This is once again the great reversal. Many are first and will end up last. And the last will end up first. Let's look at how he said it in the New King James. And he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Because with wealth, people think they can buy everything. They can buy medicine, they can buy healing, they can buy treatment, they can buy whatever they need. What need have they of God? And then he said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things. And Peter said, we've left everything and followed you. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house, family, children, land, for my sake, and the Gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now, in this time, on earth. They will receive everything, and in the age to come, they will receive eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now Yeshua predicts his death for the third time. And 
They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Yeshua was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. Once again he talks in third person. And once again he tells them what to expect in Jerusalem. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, said to him, Teacher, Rabbi, we, will, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your glory. And Yeshua said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. So Yeshua said to them, You will need, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Yeshua called them to himself and said, you know, that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, for whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now they came to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging, and when he heard it was Yeshua of Nazareth, he began to cry, saying, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. Many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out, cried out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Yeshua stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Yeshua. And Yeshua answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. And Yeshua said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Yeshua on the road. That was the book of Mark, chapter 10. Let's see what he says here, how he says it here. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave. For that is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to, not to be served, and to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this beautiful word. Thank you and praise you. Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen.